warm welcome to Black Excellence Network right here on The Real Talk. My name is Sanda Nomusaga Kwabe Kutso. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I am sitting here with Mr. Johan Erasmus. Today we're talking state capture. We want to put you into an idea on what exactly are we talking about when we talk about state capture and who are the real people behind the state capture. But before we can go any in details with the state capture, let me just uh, give you an opportunity to meet and greet Mr. Erasmus. Mr. Erasmus, good day and welcome to Black Excellence. Susanna, thank you very much. Tell us a little bit more on who exactly is this gentleman sitting beside me. A long or a short story? Uh, give me a short story. Okay, simple. <laughs> Uh, I'm in the Armed Strait, International Armed Strait. Before that, I worked for four years in the office of Mobutu Sese Seku in Kinshasa, mm -hmm. from 85 to 1990. And I've been very much involved in municipal finances. Mm -hmm. And then I've always been interested in politics, from student times. I have a lot of views which a lot of people do not like, Simple, because I like to speak the truth. Simple. Well, this is why we have you here, because at Black Excellence, we tell it like it is. Let's go straight to business right now, Mr. Erasmus. We're talking of state capture. As we're talking right now, there is an inquiry going on, um, Zondi's inquiry, which is going in details with um, the state capture. Someone at home has been hearing state capture, I mean, million times, but some people still do not understand or have a clear understanding on what exactly are we talking about when we're talking of state capture. Can you put us in a picture? State capture, in my view, is a catch-all phrase. Simple. Because ultimately it boils down to contract fraud to tender fraud. In a nutshell. <coughs> because people are getting money for work which they either did not do or work which they're not supposed to do. Okay. So basically state capture is a contract or tender fraud. This is where we are, right? That's what it is. Okay. Let's move forward um, to you, viewer at home. Now I'm about to unpack their untold stories because we tell it like it is. Let us go deep down now on the current situation on the state capture in the Republic of South Africa. We've been um, advised and, I mean, we, we as a news company, we've been reporting quite a lot on the state capture um, that implicates the Guptas, the former president, and the rest of other people that were in the former President Jacob Zuma's camp um, that are believed to have been linked to the state capture. It is believed that um, the Guptas literally owned or own the Republic of South Africa. Is that true? The Gupta's arrogance has led to this. They say so. Whether it is actually a fact, the fact is a lot of money went missing. When you look at McKinsey, McKinsey have paid back how many? 1.8 billion to ESCOM, and yet they're not even charged. So if you act criminally, as long as you pay back the money, you don't get charged. What the hell? What is wrong? When you look at the capturing of the state, let, let's, let's go back. Some of the news commentators wrote, said, you cannot go back in, further than 1994. That is hogwash. Because state capture is a part of life. Whether, wherever you are in the world, but specifically in South Africa, because it impacts on us. Mm. South Africa is not such a rich country. I mean, when Tomo Yanez from South said, he was very proud to collect a trillion. My first comment was, why did you collect 1.6 trillion? It's, it's there, it's in your grasp. Why didn't you collect it? The fact is that when we look at state capture, I'll give you an example. In the 1890s, Paul Kruger's family was working in the old ZAR Republic mm -hmm. in, the, in their civil service. Mm. At that stage, the Bura didn't pay income tax. Only the Auslanders, the foreigners, and the mining. Mm -hmm. They granted themselves loans of 500,000 British pounds, which were parked in British banks mm -hmm. until today. It was never been repaid. This came to light through a guy by the name of Dion Basson, who's passed away a couple of years ago. Then you take it further. In 1902, it's been reported. And what I'm talking about, it's on, it's on paper. I'm not talking about hearing something. I'm talking facts. Cecil John Rhodes then Premier of the Cape Province, was traveling through the Free State with other horsemen, buying up farms and mineral rights. 
A company in was a guy by the name of Paul Sauer. Paul Sauer later became the minister of Post and Telecommunications in the National Party government. State capture? Definitely. What did, what did uh, Susan John Rhodes do? He took over the diamond industry and the creation of the beers eventually. In the 1930s, the first Carnegie report on poverty said the following. Afrikaner is lazy. He doesn't want to work. He only wants to squat on the rich Dutch farmer's farm. That is what he said about the Afrikaner. Now you must remember, the Afrikaner was not in the Boer War. It was the Boer. The British signed agreement for peace with the Boer. In 1904, Jan-Hendrik Goffman in the Cape Parliament, Cecil John Rhodes, signed an agreement to create the Afrikaner. This is why today, amongst the white Afrikaans-speaking people, there's no leadership. doesn't matter what the church says. If I go and sit with a Dumini, after half an hour, he doesn't know what to say to me. I'm not an Afrikaner. I say that very clear. I'm an Afrikaans-speaking South African. There is no leadership. I'm telling you this. When you have 10 people together speaking Afrikaans, you have 20 different opinions because they cannot stand together. Black people have always stood up for me. I worked for four years in Mobutu's office in the Congo, the best days of my life and my wife's. In, during the Second World War, Sir Ernest Oppenheimer frequented uh, Jan Smuts, the Premier. So having a Premier was then part of the British War Cabinet. Mm -hmm. And it was all about one thing, the creation of Anglo-American. You want to talk about state capture? Mm. Where did Anglo-American have its fingers in? Where did the beers have its fingers in? Eventually, you see Rupert coming up with Rembrandt. Johann Rupert today talks about fraud, quite correctly. But Johann Rupert, it was alleged, I was also in intelligence in the 80s. At that stage, we intercepted signals from Anglo-American, and Rembrandt. Johan Rupert, at that stage, it was alleged, was running an intelligence operation abroad out of Europe for commercial purposes. The inter national intelligence could until today not break the code they were using. You want to talk about state capture? What has been happening? Everything what was happening under the National Party was to the benefit of certain people. During the Boer War, Jim Fouchier and his family, or his family, left South Africa for Lesotho and Swaziland with their cattle. When they came back, they were the people with the cattle. They became rich. So in other words, it's always about the money. South Africa did not have pre-1994 very clearly defined tender structures. There was a company called Van Weyck and Lowe. They used to get all the contracts for infrastructure. They became Africon, became Oricon. This is where they started. Talk about state capture. What the hell is state capture? State capture means I must have somebody in a very high position. I must have him on, his, on my payroll. I must have him do what I want. Mm. In the 1990s, I found for the, expert, for the export of a creepy crawly, you know what a creepy crawly is? To clean a swimming pool? Oh, okay, yeah. It was, in the customs code, it was put under the same paragraph as a G6 gun. The G6 guns we exported to Oman, the UAE, etc. Creepy crawly, cleaning your swimming pool is such a dangerous weapon? Come on. It was to protect Tony Factor because he was exporting creepy crawlies. Uh, he was repairing old creepy crawlies, selling them into Africa, making a killing out of it. Good luck to him. Wherever you come, state capture is not something new. In the United uh, States, the Carlisle Group, where old George Bush used to be a director, the Osama bin Laden's family were investors. They're the biggest suppliers of weaponry into the American military. Mm -hmm. Barclays Bank from Britain used to have an agreement with the American Marines that they will finance all the weaponry for them on the condition they do not finance anybody else. 
That's why we had a problem with APSA. We could now never, under British Barclays stewardship, finance South African arms trade. Mm -hmm. But the point is, state capture impacts on us, on all of us. The allegations around the Trillion Group, Trillion Company, ESCOM, people are talking about ESCOM 400 billion in the red. According to my information, it's nearer to 600 billion. The problem is what's happening about that. And this, is always, this has always been what I've been coming up against. There's two South Africans. There's a white South Africa and a black South Africa. I'm fortunate that I can straddle both to a very large degree. But the big thing is white South Africa is controlled from abroad. Mm. Okay. Even the same way as Tabun Beke has been controlled from abroad by British MI6. Because he studied there for so long, he was recruited. A guy by the name of Tomlinson, who had a labor dispute with British MI6, in his book, The Big Breach, he says, during the struggle, the ANC was very disciplined. Very disciplined. He said, after 1994, you could pay it with him 50 rand to obtain a copy of the cabinet's minutes. So in other words, as long as it's being run from abroad, Julius Malema, who did he go and see in Britain? Richard Rowling. Richard Rowling is at Chatham House. Chatham House used to be the Rhodes Trust. The Rhodes Trust comes from Cecil John Rhodes. It was started with him and A. Bailey. Mm. Now, uh, maybe not to um, intercept to Rolston on that, I just want to go back a little bit to the current situation. Um, we, we, we understand that, I mean, the Guptas have literally looted um, the country. And I think in our conversation earlier, you did mention that what the Guptas have taken out of South Africa is almost the crumbles, or really very little as compared to what um, the, 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 the National Party and its partners or whatever That's have taken out of this country. Can you actually um, go deep in that? Look, the main thing is you must understand everything was under secrecy provisions under the National Party. Mm. I mean, I was told at Stellenbosch by a beautiful black-haired black woman, if I broke their rules by taking down their people, they would close the doors for, to me. My view was very simple. So what? I'll just break down the doors then. The National Party started out in 1948. Remember, when they came into power, they didn't have suits, they didn't have cars. Nothing different to the ANC. But they learned very quickly. The biggest things in South Africa are oil, financial services, and the car industry, and then the mining, because the mining was always controlled by British interests. So the National Party, like in America, they were lobbyists, lobbying ministers to get certain viewpoints through. And that is how it was done. The National Party believed themselves to be a democracy for less than 13% of the people. But they believed. And they would always tell you they're Christians. I studied theology, believe me. But if they were Christians, tell me why apartheid. Because apartheid started in 1820 with the British settlers. When the settlers were placed in Eastern Cape, Lord Charles Somerset issued an edict saying that the garrison cannot buy fruit and vegetables or any other produce from black farmers because the quality was better and cheaper. They had to support the settlers, who were not very active in farming, but they had to get active. That's why they came out. That's where ground was given to them, land was given to them, implements and seeds. What about the black farmers? And this came out in the first Carnegie report, the last paragraph 
or the last uh, chapter. What about the poor black South Africa? Because the big thing is, I know, for instance, there was a guy by the name of Sibia during apartheid who became a nuclear physicist, but he had to stay in Botswana because he was black. He later became a senior official at uh, Mineral Energy Affairs. The pool of human talent was wasted. And when you come to the future of this country, it's about time to start exploiting this pool. Because forget the color of your skin. It's the color of your blood and the color of your mentality. Because apartheid never understood one thing, is the color of money. Remember, apartheid could never existed for more than 10 years. John Forster was approached by Fiat Bonnier, who said to him, let me take you South Africans into Africa. He refused. In October 1988, P.W. Bota came to see me in Kinshasa. He was en route to Mobutu at Guadaluliti's palace. He sent his PA task others to come and fetch me. And then he said to Magnus Malang and, and, and uh, Pup Bota, stay here, I want to talk to this man. We walked out under the tarmac at, at Njili Airport for half an hour. And I said to Mr. President, your problem lies in Pretoria, not in Africa. You are welcome. I said, but listen to the people, respect the people. And this is what it's about. State capture is about disrespect of everyone. And saying, we've captured. Tabu Beki, all the signs, everything points to MI6 being their agent. So when Jacob Zuma came into power, it was with a tacit understanding of the CIA from America, which upset the Britons. Because they would do everything to block Zuma. Mm. Okay? I mean, Fana Hongwana's name has been mentioned all over in the arms deal. Do you think Fana Hongwana did everything on his own? His partner was a guy named Johan Stockenström. There's always a, black, a white dude somewhere. And people will say to you, yeah, but it's a Jewish. Oh, it might be Jewish. There were Jewish guys around Jacob Zuma. But the main thing is, it comes from history. It comes from history throughout the world. In Japan, the Japanese banks were the biggest. Mm. I mean, when you look at Sumitomo Bank, Maru and eventually you had Marubeni. Marubeni was caught up in the Lockheed scandal with uh, the royalty of, of, of uh, the Netherlands. But the point is, it's not the only one. But again, it impacts on us. Mm. What's happening to us? Why did we fight in Angola? Because Kissinger had an influence over Forster. Why did we not do business since the 1970s with Angola? It would have been so much better for everybody involved. Mm. Um, you, you, you keep uh, bringing back this um, secret intelligence services, um, yeah. MI6. Yes. Uh, I get an understanding that it had quite a very big role to play, or still have a big role to play um, in our own country. It, it scares me a little bit. Um, Should scare you. I mean, to, to, to listen to such things. I mean, knowing that I'm in a country where I, I want to raise my children um, in an, a country that I should be proud of um, coming from, but knowing that it's being controlled from another planet, it actually shows that we're probably not going to the same um, direction. Give us a little bit more on this um, MI, MI6. Um. Okay, you've got to understand the whole, whole world intelligence services are working in South Africa. Because the Russians were always so seen as the enemy. South Africa should have rather put their future binded with the Russians and the East Bloc. There's many reasons for that. They will tell you, yeah, but with the West we could develop. You know what? In the 80s they said, look at Thailand. Thailand was never colonized. So at, in the 80s, Thailand was not so well developed. But look at Thailand today. Where's Thailand? They embraced technology. They made it their own. They went forward. Oh, yes, they also had their own state capture. Because what is state capture about? Again, I'm going back to it. It's contract fraud. It's tender fraud. It's getting paid for work you're not supposed to be doing. Or else, in the Gupta's case, getting paid without doing any work. But the question is, so we've got another commission, another commission of inquiry. What's going to happen? How many million is it going to cost? 
Now the question is, who's working for which intelligence service? George Zemanovic that was killed in Serbia early in the year. Used to know each other quite well. With George, the situation was when he opened his mouth, you had to go back 180 degrees, then you'll find the truth. But he also gave me a lot of information. George and his own contention was working for the Mossad from Israel, he was working for MI6, he was working for the CIA, and he was working for the Russians. Because of one other reason, he is related to all of these people. His father used to be the bodyguard to the king of Serbia. He was in South Africa after 94, left to um, America, where he died and was buried. Any case. These intelligence services, they do have their fingers in everything because it's about money. After the British lost the, well, after they won the Boer War, they lost their empire. That's a fact. So the British government suffered catastrophic losses. But the private sector gained, and especially under Cecil John Rhodes and like-minded, this is what happened. They took over the commercial interests. You can go and look. Nigeria, they will tell you. This is the situation around the oil. It's always about the resources. Now, going back to President Zuma. President Zuma is a, he's not a well-educated person, but he's an extremely dangerous opponent. He can strategize like you cannot believe. And whatever, you see, you must understand again, and go back white and black South Africa. Hmm. What is reported, people do not understand this, how far this man goes. And the big thing is, is it bad? Not always. He has done a lot of, of things that is highly questionable and there's things that must be corrected. No argument about it. But the main thing is, I was earlier this year in the Bahamas. On my arrival there, I was detained for a day. I was locked up in the cells for 30 minutes. Why? On suspicion of a firearm. <laughs> I said to the commander, Commander Simmons, I said to him, what's your problem? Now the people in the Bahamas are big people, the men are giants. I said to him, you lazy buggers, you should be in the Olympics, you'll clean it all. Just get a bit of action. In any case, he came to me and he apologized saying they made a mistake. In the end, it turned out that the South African inter intelligence, in order to intimidate me, asked Homeland Security via the American Embassy to lock me up for three days and then to release me. Just to mess me around. White people don't like what I'm saying. A lot of black people run away when I start talking. The big thing is, South Africa must get together. People will tell you, black and white. And the simple reason is, where are you from? Kazuru Natal, from Klavielingen. What's your totem? What animal do you dance? Animal do I dance? Yes. I'm a lion. <laughs> You're a lion. How many Malungus have asked you this question? None. Do people, do white South Africa know black South Africa? And believe me, when it comes to state capture, the Afrikaners are involved. To a lesser extent, the English and the Jews. But the Afrikaners are involved especially on the middle level to down. While we, while we at that, I mean, I looked into the reports as to the time that um, the case of the former president, Jacob Zuma, was being followed, that he, he ended up having to pay back half a million rand. But 50 million, or rather 500 million, was actually used to pay back all the legal, you know, um, to retrieve this 500,000 um, rand. It doesn't make any economical sense at all. I don't think that a person in his right mind will spend so much money to collect so little. Like you made an example of the other gentleman that you used to work with in collecting their municipal uh, finances, where he would actually spend more money but getting... Yeah, um, correct. You see, the big thing, our problem in South Africa is the legal system cannot be trusted. People will tell you the government cannot be trusted. It's a legal system. Because advocates go to court, as they have the right to do. What, what, how do they earn their living? They even give prostitutes a bad name. Because they're selling their time. Prostitute does that too. And their experience. They're also selling their experience. 
but 40 to 80,000 rand a day. And they don't, they're not interested in finishing the case, they're interested in stretching to over three, four, five years. Mm. Because they only want to milk their people. That is why, as long as the legal system stays the way it stays, state capture will be a thing happening every day. Listen to what I'm telling you. Whoever is talking now about state capture, SARS is one of the big problems. Whatever they say, so I know firsthand. SARS is one of the biggest problems because it's not an honest organization. It comes from way back in the time of the National Party. Because when the Boers didn't pay income tax in the old ZAR, the Sanko group of companies never paid regional services council levies until we cleaned them out in the 90s. Interesting enough, RSC levies, the payment of the levies was repealed by Trevor Manuel in 2006. The act has never been repealed. At that stage, it cost local government on one day 8 billion rand. Remember? Mm. The rand was 8 to the dollar. A billion dollars. Today, 15 billion rand. Out of local government. Unencumbered income. Who captured Trevor Manuel? After his um, stint as Minister of Finance, and he was a good Minister of Finance because he allowed his people to do the job, but he committed a lot of sins as well. He went to work for the Rothschild Bank. Mm. This is really getting here. I want to know, but maybe before we, we just wrap it up, is there hope for South Africa? And if there is hope for South Africa, how can we stop this? This, this, this is now our responsibilities as the young South Africans to, to stand up and fix our own country. What is it that, in your opinion, that we need to do in order to, you know, fix the problems that we're facing right now? Susanna, you're right. There is hope. There is hope in this country. Make no mistake. A lot of the people that left South Africa, especially the white people, are the people that benefited the most from apartheid, from state capture. People of family of politicians. I'm not talking about people later saying, I'm going abroad because I cannot handle the situation, etc., etc. What can be done? You can say many things. But the biggest thing is there's no leadership. Even Cyril Ramaphosa, it is said, is weaker than Fana Longwana. Fana Longwana was the guy in the arms steel. But the Menels from Anglo Val, friends of F.W. de Klerk, they were never picked on like Fana Longwana. They were mentioned as by the by. So what's going on? Only thing I can say is everyone must be a leader. Everyone. When you go to Switzerland, me, you they will pick on naturally. But me, and it's been and it happened. They look at me and say, you're not Swiss. I say, why? You dress differently. And of course I speak to them in one of their languages. They say, you must buy a train ticket for the tram. So here's my ticket. Oh, okay. When you get in, you must put it into the little machine and have it chopped. That is what is. Everyone in Switzerland will ask you, what are you doing? How are you doing? Where are you going? Helping you, but telling you, we're watching you. And this is what must happen here. There are too many people beholden to poor people, and they are lying through their teeth, black and white. White people are afraid of black people. Do you know why? Because they don't respect black people. That's where the problem lies. They don't understand respect because they don't respect themselves. Doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter what their rank are, doesn't matter how much money they've got in the bank. But we have a future. By the grace of God, I'm telling you that. Inshallah, inshallah. You understand? Mm -hmm. We have. So good, real. Yeah, but you must understand one thing. I'm coming from a white background. Afrikaans speaking raised. The, in my time, the Roman Catholic was the devil incarnate. We never learned about Muslims. I come from the Cape. Although we had the Malays, eventually I started to get into contact. I was treated the most hospitable in a Muslim country. 
not a Christian country. And this is where it comes about. We have a, we have a future. We have a future. We have a future in this country. We have a future in Africa. But the big thing is, there are too many fingers in the pie from too many dark forces, specifically the intelligence agencies, because everyone mm. has got his own agenda to line his own pockets. Mm. It's, it's incredible. But when you link them back, it all goes back to foreign handlers. The old security services, military intelligence, the old CCB, they are, most of them are these days working for foreign intelligence services, supplying information. Thumbs up. Thumbs up in most cases. State capture. State capture starts by people not doing their work correctly. Treasury came in and made a whole spiel about tenders. We have an, an act, 12 of 2004, Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities, Section 34. If you suspect corruption, you must report it, otherwise you're deemed to be guilty. Mm. Just on this basis, the whole of Parliament is guilty. Just on this basis, the whole of Parliament is guilty, including the Cabinet. That is why, that is why state capture can, can, can flourish. Wow. Thank you very much. I hope I shocked you. No, you did. <laughs> Welcome. A lot of information has come out here, and I'm quite very sure that the viewers back home will probably need some more of this, and probably us, um, we may need to maybe re-invite you again. You're most um, welcome. To come back and, you know, um, elaborate a little bit more on this, maybe just because of time, what would be your last words um, under the state, the state capture? Let's do it. Clean out state capture, because one thing, you cannot sail against the storm. You're not a Don Quixote. You have to tack your sails. In other words, you have to go at an angle against the wind. We can do it, but then everyone must be a leader. Everyone must be willing, because if you have a right to anything, even if it's to ground, you also have an obligation. Mm. Live up to that obligation. Understand mm. it. Make a difference where you walk, and not just in McDonald's, wherever you are. Yeah, thank you so much. South Africans, you have had it. Um, let us all take responsibility and make a difference wherever we are. This is our country and we have an obligation, which is to take care of it and also fix it. Let's fix our country, South Africans. My name is Sasanda Nomosaga Kwabi Kuto. I'm sitting right here on Real Talk with Black Excellence Network. Join us once again next week. We'll be talking to one very, very, very sharp person just as we have today. So do not miss it up. Uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank you.